you all be seated. We've been working our way through First and Second Peter. I must say, it's been a marvelous experience for me. Peter is a genius in the sense that he had stood and listened to Jesus teaching. And that's the mind of God and the mind of Christ, of course, beautifully reflected. And the way he summarizes all the major doctrines is just staggering to me. Every time I go through this book, these two little books, I marvel at it. I wish we had time. Perhaps next week before we move on to something else, we should recap some of the great themes to make sure that you, for instance, are understood that the seed message of the kingdom is the seed of immortality. That's the born-again material in First Peter. Are you ready to explain that to your friends? Can you open 1 Peter 1, verse 22, and discuss the seed of the gospel of the kingdom, being born again? And this is the heart of the faith. I don't hear this being preached with any clarity in popular evangelicalism. And many other things. The revelation of Jesus Christ is coming. And then instructions on family, of course, husbands and wives. The phrase I see there in 1 Peter 4 about obeying the gospel of God. You don't hear that language. Obeying the gospel of God. You hear talk about accepting Jesus, giving your heart to Jesus and so on. But how about obeying the gospel of God? This is Jesus' language. This is apostolic language. So immerse yourselves in the words of Peter and you'll be immersing yourself in the words of Jesus himself. And when that chief pastor arrives, that being Jesus, he's the pastor, he's your ultimate pastor. When he arrives, then you will receive the fading, unfading rather, crown of glory. And that's not just some religious cliche. You're going to be a king or a queen in the kingdom. We haven't yet, I think, fully explored that. People read these words as religious cliches. They have little meaning until unpacked, so we need to try to do that. Then we're in, in Second Peter, we we read of the false prophets, a very grim section in chapter 2, a terrible indictment then of people who get the words and the word of God twisted to their own destruction. Very threatening. So those of us who teach had better bear in mind the words of James that we are to suffer a greater judgment. We'd better get it right to the best of our ability because to mislead people using scripture to do it is a terrible thing to do. Then we get to the final chapter of 2 Peter, that's chapter 3, and my heading in the NASU that I'm using here, we're reading around mostly in the NASU, I think Barbara has an NLT, New Living Translation, whatever translation you're using will be fine, give us the sense, and the purpose of this letter is the title over chapter 3, so if I may start reading chapter 3 verse 1, and ask Sarah, who's having a little struggle with our dog here for the moment, <laughs> however oh, we'll get beyond that and past that. And I'll do chapter 3, 1, ask Sir to do 3, 2. Here we go, chapter 3 of Second Peter. This is now, beloved, the second letter I'm writing to you, in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. That you should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Saviour spoken by your apostles. First, I want to remind you that in the last days there will be scoffers who will laugh at the truth and do every evil thing they desire. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? Forever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. <coughs> Verse 5. Go ahead, Ron. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By which means the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Let's take that section. I confess I don't have answers and explanations to all of these passages. Maybe some of you do out there can help us. But let me make a few comments and then we'll invite you to, to add to the store of information we can put together between us. Beloved is nice, isn't it? He loves those people. 
He writes to them as an apostle. He has the great benefit of having sat at the feet of Jesus for three years, three and a half years, or whatever. And that's a very important thing, is it not? Those of us who sat at the feet of important teachers know what that teacher taught. So there's nothing like first-hand experience. Peter is imbued with the words of Jesus. He listened to him teach. We need to stress that because of this, um, this marvelous uh, fact in verse 2. You should remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets. I take it that takes in the whole range of Old Testament prophecy. Fifteen prophets who spoke mostly about the kingdom of God, incidentally, and the things that happened just before it. Fifteen prophets, those all spoke to us. And the commandments of the Lord and Saviour spoken by your apostles. Well, some systems of theology say, who cares about the teachings of Jesus? Remember Kennedy down in Florida? Many people think the teachings of Jesus are important. That's not so, he said, with all the authority of the church behind him, so to speak. That's not so. The teachings of Jesus are not important. What really counts is that God came and died for your sins. Watch out. That's it's catastrophically wrong. Anybody who suggests that the gospel is not from the words of Jesus is fundamentally wrong. That should be detectable. So we need to be sure that we're hearing the words of Jesus, the gospel as Jesus preached it, I think. And these are the commandments of the Lord, the boss, and Savior, spoken by your apostles. That's interesting, isn't it? Your apostles. They are our apostles. And we treat them then as we would any very, very distinguished teacher. And beyond that, because they are inspired in a way that we are not, God used them in a very special way, not that they were sinners, of course, and they weren't certainly writing under dictation, but they knew what Jesus had taught, and they were smart enough men to write it in good, intelligible Greek, and we have that in front of us in various translations, as we know. So he's stirring up our sincere mind, our pure mind, stirring it up, reminding us. I imagine we need that every week, do we not? To be stirred up, to keep the fire of faith burning, and that's what Peter's doing for us here. So, uh, if you're keeping a hub of verses, the stress on the teaching of Jesus, I've given you these verses many times, but Hebrews 5, 9 is fundamental. You don't hear this preached very much. Hebrews 5, 9 says that salvation is given to those who obey Jesus. Hebrews 5, 9. That's amazing. Isn't it? You'd think that would be a John 3, 16 all over the place. Salvation is given to those who obey Jesus. Well, the opposite would be that salvation is not given to those who refuse to obey Jesus. So you examine yourself and you say, is there an area of my life where I'm in flat-out disobedience? If, for instance, I'm shaking my fist at baptism, or I'm doubtful about water baptism, watch out. You're in danger of being in conflict with Jesus. That's not good. Some of our colleagues have come from backgrounds where it was said that water baptism doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We don't want to do it. That's fine. But who cares? That's in danger of being in flat-out contradiction and conflict with Jesus, it seems to me. These are easy things. You're supposed to repent, that's a command. You're supposed to be baptized, that's a command. And you're supposed to obey Jesus. So, that's, I think, my thought on that, on that opening statement there. Hub of verses in Hebrews 5, 9, 1 Timothy 6, 3 says that if anybody comes to you and doesn't bring the words, the sound health-giving words, namely the words of Jesus. If he doesn't bring those, watch out, you're being scammed, bamboozled, taken in. That's 1 Timothy 6.3. And then, of course, there's the wonderful one in John 3.36, which says that he who believes in Jesus is doing good. He who disobeys Jesus is in danger of having hell hang over him. That awful thing about being destroyed in the fires of hell. I mean, aren't these marvelous verses? Why is John 3.16 the only one that people know? What about John 3.36? I'll repeat it. He who believes in Jesus is doing well. He has the life, the life that is of the age to come, eternity. The life of the coming kingdom, immortality. But the one who disobeys Jesus, see the other side of that coin, from belief is disobedience. It's very easy. So that's John 3.36 and 1 Timothy 6.3. You've got 2 John 5-9 through 9 is an excellent passage. Again, he says, if somebody comes to you and doesn't bring the teaching of Messiah, and the devil will play with your mind in that little phrase, teaching of Messiah, and some will, will hear that as well, that's teaching about Jesus only, that he died and rose. It certainly is that. But what about the subjective genesis, to be technical, the teaching as Jesus taught it? If you lose your basis in Jesus, 
as, for instance, in the system of ultra-dispensationalism, which says that Paul preached a different gospel than Jesus, you're absolutely ruining the Bible from start to finish. It's hard to imagine anything more catastrophic than saying that the words of Jesus are unimportant. That's a quick way into destruction, I would think. Finally, then, the whole passage in John 12, 44 and following, John 12, 44 and following, where the summary of Jesus' ministry is devastatingly good. Jesus simply says there in John 12, where I just refer to it, that you better listen to my words or else. I was sent by God, he said. The words that I'm speaking to you are God's words, they're not mine. I got them from God. Listen carefully. You're going to be judged by those words anyway. My goodness, couldn't be clearer. I think we would have excuse. So that's the point then of verse 2. The commandments of the Lord and Saviour spoken by your apostles. Now we get to a favourite topic of all of us as Adventists. We are Adventists here from the Abrahamic faith in the 1850s. The surgeons of Adventism. We're not Seventh-day Adventists. We don't think the Seventh Day has any significance in the New Covenant. But we are Adventists. We believe very much in the Second Coming, that famous Greek word parousia which occurs about 24 times in the New Testament, and it's a visible arrival of Jesus. So where in your Bible would you go to show that Jesus is coming back? Visibly? Well, we won't turn to it necessarily, but refer to it in Acts chapter 1, about verse 5 and 6. You'll find that the statement is made there that Jesus is going to come back in the same way that you saw him go. That presumably is visible. They saw him go visibly and disappeared in the cloud. Maybe we'll just turn to make sure I got the right verse there. This is your Bible study now with friends across the coffee table or whatever. Uh, isn't yes. it that? Did I get the right verse? Um, 111. 111, sorry, I didn't. I skipped. 111 of Acts. We're talking about the parousia, as Peter's about to do. They also said, these angels, two men in white clothing, men of Galilee, why are you standing looking into the sky? This Jesus, and nobody else, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. Do you want to argue about that? Let's not. The Bible has become a seething <coughs> argument, quite unnecessarily. It's a book to be believed and obeyed by ordinary folk, understanding ordinary language generally, not much of a problem. That's utterly clear. But in the Church of England days, we asked the clergyman, what do you do with the parousia in the second coming? He said, that's the sermon I'm supposed to do once a year. I have no idea what that is. I can imagine, I can see the man standing there. I have no idea what that is, but I'm supposed to preach on it once a year. What? Without the second coming, the New Testament is eviscerated. Okay, so, verse 3 says then, first of all, in the last days, I think we've been in the last days, roughly speaking, since the time of Jesus, the very last of the last days may still be in the future. I think probably it's still in the future, it doesn't matter. The general statement, all the time of the 2,000 years that's elapsed since Christ was here on earth, these last days, these final days, scoffers, critics, may I say scholars with the lying pen, watch out for the scholars, the lying pen of the scholars, very easily taken in. The people are, oh, he's got a PhD, and an MA, and a TH, and all sorts of, he's got to know what he's talking about. Not necessarily. It might be that a little old lady reading the Bible with open eyes is doing better than some of the scholars. I refer you to Jeremiah if you want confirmation of that. He's very, very angry with scholarship and teachers who are working out of the imagination of their own hearts. Devastating me. So there are scoffers, there are mockers um, in the last days following their own lusts, their own desires, presumably their desire to be well known or to be accepted, to be popular, whatever the motive might be, saying, where is the promise of his parousia? famous word. Three words for the second coming in the New Testament, parousia, apocalypsis, revelation that is, apocalypsis, and epiphania is the outshining, the bright outshining event, which is his second coming, and of course many other references simply to Jesus coming, so it's a major topic, and they're saying, these people, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep in death, that's Psalm 13, 3, the sleep of the dead, the sleep of the dead, when you're dead, you're actually dead, the dead know nothing at all, you tell your friends, please ask these 5, 9 and 10, there's no activity at all in Sheol, you're dead, you're out of it, you can't say anything, do anything when you're dead. Very important doctrine. 
So when the fathers, uh, since the fathers fell asleep in death, Psalm 13:3, everything these people say continues just as it was from the beginning of the Genesis creation. At least the seven days there were the account of uh, that early part of creation is given us. So, is that really so? Uh, I'm not sure that everything's continued exactly the same. <laughs> Somewhat debatable point, but I know what they're getting at. Where's the second coming? It hasn't happened, therefore it couldn't happen. Can you, can you address uh, something? Uh, I was having a conversation on, online about this exact topic. Uh, okay. The person said, I'm not a preterist or I'm not a person who believes the kingdom came. Good. But, they but, said, yeah. uh, this, this gospel that Jesus came preaching uh -huh. included the very easy words, the kingdom is near or the kingdom is at hand yes. or it's close, right? Yes. So what exactly was it? Oh. How, how was that different from... All, all the other people before Jesus, who for thousands of years before Jesus, yes. said the same thing, and the kingdom still... Well, I, I think it's not. simply a question uh, of seeing that every prophet, including Jesus, says the kingdom of God is at hand. So they're all equally right or wrong. Now, if you say Jesus was wrong, then you've given up the faith. That's quite clear. He has, has to be right. But when he says the kingdom of God is at hand, it's near, it's approaching, he's only saying what all the prophets said. Uh, that was many hundreds of years before. So it's a way of putting you on the brink of this coming kingdom, which is the only thing that matters. I take it. I take it. That's the answer. Unless we've got some better explanation. It's a way of speaking, but it isn't exact chronology. In fact, did they know when the kingdom was coming? Did Jesus know? I don't think so. They didn't know when. I think they did not expect it to be 2,000 years. I doubt if Jesus did. In fact, he said in Acts 1 6, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. That's quite clear. When they said, is it now time for you to restore the kingdom to Israel in Acts 1.6? Jesus' answer is, it's not for you, and presumably himself, to know. Only the Father knows the times, that's to say the chronological points and the chronological stretches of time, the times and the seasons. And so, did Jesus in fact then say, well, it's going to be within one generation? <laughs> that couldn't be right. He could well have just said, well, didn't I tell you it was going to be within 40 years? Or 80 years? He didn't say that, of course. He didn't mean by yene ah, 40 or 80 years, he meant this evil society. But he makes no statement about how close it is. So I think we're balancing the text. If we just take the one verse, the kingdom of God is at hand, we could say that's in all the prophets. In Haggai, you'll find that in a very little while, God is going to intervene. In a very little while, I'm going to step in and change everything. Well, how long is a very little while? I don't think they knew and don't think Jesus knew, and so it's obviously impossible to say that Jesus was wrong. He doesn't make a statement, right. as far as I know, chronologically, until you get to that final 70th week of Daniel, then I think you are talking literal three and a half year periods. That's a different subject. When you get that close, you probably have it mapped out a little bit more. more well, detail. I, I oh. pointed to the text, uh, there are many texts, but the one that I was reminded of was uh, Luke 16, 16, mm -hmm. where Jesus says, the law and the prophets... Uh, were proclaimed yes. until the, the, bapti the baptism of John. Until John. Mm -hmm. Since then, yes. the gospel of the kingdom of God has been proclaimed. Yes. And everyone is, in this translation says, urged mm -hmm. to enter into it. Yes. So Fine. the, the, the answer I gave was, well, I can only put it down to God's long suffering, long patience. Right with humanity that, why not? you know, yes, it's true, that, that, that particular aspect of mm -hmm. the gospel, Jesus didn't change. He came saying the same things yeah. others for thousands of years said. Absolutely. Although, obviously, with his coming, there was a change of law, change of covenant, sure. etc. But mm -hmm. in terms of the gospel message, yeah. true, Jesus didn't really, you know, well, he obviously didn't bring it. The kingdom and not not in the, in the, the as the French say the proprement dit properly speaking the kingdom lies in the future proprement dit strictly speaking if you if you look at the kingdom statements in Mark you'll find that 98 or in fact 100 percent of them refer to that future event there are about two percent that might refer to the future that's fine we'll agree with anything you want to say about the presence of the kingdom I believe the kingdom is right here among us now 
if we're talking of the kingdom, the spirit of the kingdom is here. Jesus certainly was there as the king of the kingdom, whatever exactly is meant in Luke 17. But you don't start with the more doubtful and difficult verses, you start with easy ones. Like, for example, that Joseph of Arimathea was still waiting for the king after the ministry of Jesus. Like, for example, in Luke 21, when you see all these catastrophic things happening, you ought to know that the kingdom of God is about to come. This is very clear. You're to pray thy kingdom come. You're not to pray thy kingdom spread. Unfortunately, in popular religion, the kingdom is almost exclusively something present. It's, it's become a moral kingdom in the heart. Well, that's fine. We should certainly demonstrate the spirit of the kingdom in that way. But we should also realize that the kingdom of God in the future is the center of interest for Jesus and the prophets. So it, it's a, a big, not a big study, really. All you do is take a Bible and ask yourself, where does it say we've inherited the kingdom? No. And the other text I pointed to, funny enough, was yeah. uh, verse 9 here, which, mm -hmm. uh, have we read verse 9? Uh, verse 9? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Lord is not slow right. concerning his promise, as some yeah. count slowness, but he is patient yes. with us, not because he doesn't want us to perish. Right. So I pointed to That's fine, yes. That's it. Yeah. Yes. The only that's the parallel to that's First Timothy two, isn't it, where it says that God wants everybody to be saved. First Timothy two four, in your margin there, against verse nine. First Timothy two four says that God wants everybody to be saved, right. not only the people in the church, which are who are addressed, I think, in this verse, but God wants everyone to be saved. Right. And of course that's very much against Calvinism because we do see, sadly, that not everybody gets saved in Scripture. There are some who are irretrievably lost, however few or many that might be, doesn't matter, some are lost, and yet God wants everybody to be saved. That, of course, speaks to free will. This one is particularly addressed to the church, patient towards you, so that would imply that some in the church were shaky. Don't assume that just because you've been baptized that you made it, you haven't. You have then to continue to the end. You have to grow in grace and knowledge and persist to the end. That's quite clear. Just a comment on one. Yeah. I, I'm having a, my writing is real small. I can okay. see it, so if you'll go. It's uh, Randy Acts 3.21. Yes. Uh, it says, Perfect. Countdown 3.21, until the times of restoration of all things. Very nice. Acts 3.21. Wonderful. Acts 1.6 and Acts 3.21. In your margin of yeah. there, Acts 1.6, we mentioned, is this the time they finally say, after a six-week lecture on the kingdom, Jesus was obsessed with the kingdom, talks of the six long weeks, after he rose from death, and at the end of that session, they say, has the time finally come for you to restore national sovereignty to Israel? Calvin says, how stupid can you be? Calvin says, there are more errors in that question than there are words. That's fundamentally false, I want to say. Fundamentally false. That's the right question. If you attack the apostles there, you're attacking their, their, their teacher, Jesus. You're attacking Jesus. Those people were not idiots. They had worked with Jesus for three and a half years, and now they have a six-week series of lectures on the kingdom of God, at the end of which they don't ask a dumb question. You see, that's the lying pen of the scribe, by the way. If you think that's a bad question, then you think Jesus was a bad teacher, and you think the apostles are stupid. Don't, you don't want to get it. That, that's unwise. So Randy's exactly right to mention Acts 3.21. I like that. Got that? 3, 2, 1, count. Oh, excellent. Remember that forever. I love those things, right? Uh, also, he, he yeah. adds... Uh, uh, in verse 15, I think, spoken by your apostles, yes. Peter affirms that Paul was speaking the same message yes. as the Lord Jesus. Paul was not proclaiming a different Good gospel point. message. It's a great point. It's very 15. much needed. Your apostles will certainly include Paul. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's one. We don't have apostles at the, 11, uh, the level of, of Paul. If we did, they would be doing the crediting signs and wonders. And you have to have seen Jesus literally to be an apostle at that level. We don't have him today. You could have some sort of a church planting. I, I, I would hesitate to call him an apostle, but various functions in the church. I see that. But you cannot have an apostle at the level of the Twelve and Paul. That's just not reasonable. Okay, 321 in Countdown 321 goes along with Acts 1 6, where in 321, heaven must retain him. Peter was a good speaker, wasn't he? You see how clear they are? Heaven has to retain Jesus where he is now. He's at the right hand of the Father, Psalm 110. One. Heaven has to retain him until, until, until the time comes for the apokatastasis. We taught our children when they were this high, that Greek word apokatastasis, which means standing up again what has fallen down, getting everything right. 
about which all the prophets spoke. So that's why you pour over the prophets, because they talk about that restoration, apocatastasis. You see the connection between that 321 and Acts 1 6. Is this the time for you to restore? Same the verb there to restore, to put it all back together, because it's obviously fallen apart, and it's not for you to know that time. Jesus didn't know himself. But then Peter, in those marvelous sermons, thrilling sermons and acts, with lucid clarity, he says that heaven must retain the Messiah until the time comes for the restoration, apokatastasis, throw out a Greek word or two occasions, it's kind of a fun word to say, the standing up catastasis, standing up again, we've heard of stasis, standing up, both putting it back, saying it up again, about which all of the prophets spoke. Uh, uh, Dan, Dan Shaw, I yeah. recently told my students a uh, social studies Christianity uh, mm. uh, topic about the kingdom, only a few had heard of the idea. Exactly. <laughs> the idea. Wow. And then somebody asked how old are they? They're 12, 12 years old. Um, it's maybe more. Right. Okay, they're children. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, obviously, this is not uh, not in any way for any of us, and, and Dan is not doing this at all. That's an excellent. Right. Thing. Dan adds One. the Michigan yeah. State education standards yeah. require that seventh graders understand the ideas and development of Christianity. Yeah. All right, That's Good standards. Good. Well, then the question will be: How much do they understand? Right. Let them write a half page on what, what's the kingdom of God. If you don't understand the kingdom of God, you don't understand Jesus. Period. It's simply impossible must get hold of the idea of the kingdom. Of course, you begin in Daniel, and all the prophets work through verse by verse. But I'm so glad those verses came up, and Randy, particularly thanks to you, because you came out of a different system, and you see how catastrophically wrong that was. We've all come out of various backgrounds, and we're doing our best to put the pieces together in a better way than we used to in some of those former days. So that's wonderful. Dan, uh, by the way, for the rest of you who don't know, Dan is in Michigan. He is a history teacher by profession, I think. A very avid Church of God person. I think he's known these two since, since birth, virtually. He always has uh, good comments. And that's D. Shaw for the people. D. Shaw, D. Shaw right. S. H. A. L. D. L. Shaw. D. L. Shaw. The one so we're talking about. Randy Karsha was at our recent conference. So we appreciate you men very, very much. Please add your comments constantly to supplement what we have to say. No one person has everything to say that needs to be said about any subject. We give what we have our, from our own experience, and then we rely on others to supplement or challenge or modify what we say, of course. Shall Anything else out there? Continue reading. Continue reading? Yeah. All right. So can get through. Okay. Good stuff. Uh, where are we? Verse 10. Verse. Who's got verse 10? Me. Sarah. <clears throat> the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up mm -hmm. or laid bare. Or laid bare, right. Thank you. Verse 11. Since everything around us is going to melt away, what holy, godly lives you should be living. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth, in which righteousness dwells. Good. All right. That's wonderful. Now, the devil has a playground going here. He loves to twist and turn these verses. Now, first of all, you have this thing in the King James about the earth and its works being, well, it gives the impression of being totally burned up, even in the NSV. Mm -hmm. In your margin, you have a much more intelligent reading, which would be that the earth is going to be un, uh, laid bare, something like that, discovered. Obviously, if you're going to burn up the globe, the promise to Abraham and the rest of every, everybody else is futile. I think, wasn't it John Rice? Remember that thing he used to write out for us? Uh, John Rice said, what's Abraham going to say? Where's my world? Where's my earth? Oh, I'm sorry, I just destroyed it. The whole thing is absurd. It's laughable. And therefore, Peter does not mean that the globe is going to be destroyed. Otherwise, well, it's going to be. used the analogy earlier about the flood. I mean, the earth yeah. was not destroyed in the flood, but it did talk about, you know, you, you mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. that the world at that time was destroyed, mm -hmm. being flooded with water. That's yes. in verse 6. Mm -hmm. And we know the earth was not obliterated Blown from up. the universe. Good point. So, yes. yeah, so mm -hmm. in the same way, it's just, it's a different kind of destruction of not only society but 
physical physical yes. parts of the earth. Cleansing. Cleansing. Cleansing is certainly a purifying gift. Um, you, you took us absolutely rightly back to the bit that I should have commented on. Uh, let me just make, supplement your comment there. You, you referred us back. The world at that time. The heavens and the earth. That's a reference to Genesis. It's a comment on <coughs> Genesis chapter 1. Where note that the earth was formed out of water. It wasn't formed out of nothing. It was formed out of water. There was water there. There was some sort of shapeless mass. It wasn't zero. And Peter is now giving us a comment on how God formed that world order for man. Man as he sees the heavens with the sky and the birds flying in the sky and he looks at the sun in the sky and so on. It's a beautiful picture of society, the world as created for man. Now that heavens and earth was destroyed at the flood. Please note that carefully. That heavens and earth was destroyed at the flood. It certainly doesn't mean the galaxies, I think. I don't think anybody thought the sun and the moon were destroyed at the flood. We're talking about the world order as man sees it. And so there was a new heaven and new earth after the flood. That's interesting, isn't it? Note the symbolism of water and fire. Water and fire. Which is, yeah. which is our, our process of being born again. Very good. By water. Right, and fiery water. trial, all of that. Or the, the, the fire of the spirit, if you want to. Right, it. that too. Symbolic. I'm reminded exactly. of Jesus. Uh, mm -hmm. That verse I told you during the week in John 4, where he uh, says mm -hmm. to Nicodemus, mm -hmm. in order to be born again, you must go through water. Yes. And through Very good. the spirit. And even the, the word went through and the water. spirit is right. symbolic of the fire, right? As Certainly. Well. Lots of good symbolism there. Point, major point being then that the heavens and earth does not mean the total of the galaxies because they were not destroyed in the flood. So when Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, he probably doesn't mean the stars of the galaxies will all disappear. Well, this world order will not come to an end of all these things happening. Are, are going to happen. That, that's very well, clear. Well, it's interesting that Genesis account starts yeah. with a chaotic sure. system already. There's something there. So it's already there. Something and more God more starts right. doing. Yeah, this of course, I mean, I'll just say this in presence, this removes from us the need to argue with scientists about how long the galaxies might or might not have been here. It simply separates those two subjects and no need to get into any arguments with that, about that, I think. So the, pr the present heavens and earth then those are the ones since the flood, you got it? Mm -hmm. There was a new heaven and earth when Noah walked out of the ark. Philo gets this right too. The Greek word is parinesia. In the new world, Jesus said. He, Jesus loved this. Matthew 19, 28. In the new world, when the world is reborn, you're going to sit on thrones to administer the twelve tribes, he said to them. Well, the world was reborn after the flood. And it's going to be reborn at the second coming, apparently. It doesn't mean that the whole earth is destroyed, that would be impossible. So presumably that, that reference then in um, verse 10 is to a reconstruction of the world, discovered, laid bare, and whatever the elements are, the elements are sometimes the demonic forces, are the demons going to be dissolved into nothing? It's possible, I'm not sure about that. Whatever that is, there's a, a dissolution going on in the heavens, and the earth will be laid bare, and its works, all of its evil, will be destroyed. Well, so. it says the elements will be dissolved. Yes. What are the elements? The elements are sometimes the, the demonic forces. Uh, I'm not sure how to conclude there. Not the cosmos, not the rest of the cosmos. No, I don't think the stars. The stichia, no. The stichia. More likely the demonic forces. Yeah. What, what is that word? Stichia. Stichia, yeah. the elements. In other places, that would be a study on it, so in a reference to the demonic forces, are the demons who are now part of the subluminous space, uh, the prince, hmm. there was the prince, the power of the air. So it's not talking about the mountains and No, it's not talking about elements and atoms and yeah. stuff no, like no, that. No, no, no. I think sun, the moon, the the elements is probably not the best right. translation. Right, right. elements is very bad in English, isn't it? It doesn't yeah. have much, right? So demonic, yeah. demonic forces. forces. Maybe yeah. the demons are going to be dissolved and put out of commission, destroyed. Maybe powers, maybe? Powers. Absolutely. Yep, that's yeah, good. But if you compare it to the Matthew 24, mm -hmm. in Matthew 24, the, 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 the rest of the cosmos sounds like they're going to go through some type of destruction. Or the cosmos? Yeah, the sun, the moon. 
when Jesus talks about if the sun and the moon are going to be darker, there's going to be cosmic disturbances. But right. that should be in our atmosphere that makes yeah. it look dark. It doesn't mean the sun's going to be dark. It doesn't mean the whole the sun will be destroyed. Yes. Certainly, heaven is signs immediately after the great tribulation, Matthew 24. But no, no doubt about that. Then he says in verse 11, since all these things are, are going to be destroyed in this way, now we get to the Christian living them. Isn't that nice? Peter constantly does the quote doctrine and then he follows with the Christian living. The point is, isn't that interesting? The point is, what sort of people should we be in view of this in holy conduct and God-likeness? I think we all have a fair, a goodish idea of what that would, would look like. Obviously, Sexual purity is a major thing. Obviously, honesty at every level. Reliability, those things that people neglect sometimes. We're all guilty of making mistakes here, I see that. But good conduct, honest, holy conduct, not Sabbath keeping, moon, new moon keeping, <coughs> not holy day keeping, that's nothing to do with good conduct in the new covenant. But straight Christian living is what we have to be pursuing. And God likeness, be like me, God said. I am holy so you better be holy also. Looking for, expectantly, and hastening, praying for it to come, the parousia, same word here, the coming of God's day, and that's certainly the second coming. We're not leaping over a thousand years, years here, I think at all, that just doesn't make any sense, we're not looking forward to that time, beyond a thousand years, but looking for God's day, the Lord's day, the day of Jesus, the day of Christ, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat, whatever that is exactly. But, according to his promise, didn't he talk about the promise of his coming in verse 4? Same thing. Because of this promise of the parousia, we, Christians, are looking for new heavens and new earth in which things are done right rather than wrong. That rather heavy word righteousness just smacks of church, doesn't it? Things are right, and all of you could give a half an hour sermon, I know, on what you think is wrong with the present system. We all know that. That's going to be fixed. And this new society, remember, heavens and earth doesn't mean a new set of galaxies. It means a new order is going to be in place as of the coming of Jesus. And where would he get this from then? The phrase new heavens and new earth. In your margin, you have it there, don't you? Isaiah 65, 17. Just flip back there a second. Isaiah 65, 17, that phrase occurs twice there in Isaiah. 65 and 17. You know the passage well. We've, we've read it several times, I think, even recently. Behold, I'm creating a new society. Perhaps that's the way to put it. A new world order. And the former one will not be remembered or come to mind. Verse 18, be glad and rejoice for everyone I'm creating. So this is something you'd be thrilled about. Behold, I'm creating Jerusalem. Wow. It sounds to me awfully like Jerusalem. Anybody want to argue with that? I don't think there's any need to argue with it. Jerusalem for rejoicing, her people for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem, be glad in my people, and there will be no longer heard in her, in Jerusalem, the voice of weeping and the sound of crying, with which your television screen is filled day by day, is it not? Aren't you heartbroken by the awful murder of the policemen and everybody else? I mean, it's just mayhem and chaos a large part of the time no longer will that be so voice of weeping sound of crying no longer will there be in it an infant who only lives a few days or an old man who doesn't live out his days the youth will die at the age of a hundred so we're talking about mortal people <coughs> too but they're dying at a ripe old age and at a young age if it's only a hundred the one who doesn't reach the age of a hundred will be thought to be either accursed or unlucky or something Whatever, the detail of that. They're going to build houses, inhabit them. Plant vineyards. They will not build and another inhabit, not plant and another eat, and it won't be taken over by someone else. For as the lifetime of a tree, <coughs> excuse me, so will the days of my people be. And my chosen ones, my elect, will wear out the work of their hands. I think somebody said, of the floor that I'm looking at in front of me, they said, this will outlive you by many, many years. This hardwood floor, that's entirely true. This is talking about the mortals, though, not the immortals. Obviously, yes. The children dying are not, are not immortals, obviously. They will not labor in vain or bear children, they're bearing children for calamity, 
They are the offspring of those blessed by Yahweh and their descendants with them. It will come to pass that before they call, I will answer. While they're still speaking, I will hear. Isn't that, isn't that great? God is very close to those people. And then the famous saying, which is repeated in Isaiah 11, wolf and lamb will graze together, lion will eat straw like the ox. They will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says Yahweh. I get it. That's a very plain picture of a new society, isn't it? Can I just add a yes. Zephaniah 3.20? Yes, what does that At say? that time I will gather you, at that time I will bring you home, mm -hmm. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says Yahweh. All of the people that God exalts, be they immortals in the kingdom, or distinguished people who are not yet immortal, whatever it is, they get praise and honor and glory. It struck me only recently that Paul had said that in Romans 2.7. Did you ever think of this? The Christians, the good people, are supposed to be seeking for glory and honor and immortality. They get the light of the age to come. It's very interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Nothing wrong with seeking glory and honor and praise. It makes you more useful in the service of God. That's a good idea, isn't it? Well, especially if God gives it to you. If God gives it to you, don't say no. I was reading yesterday in 1 Chronicles 28. David woke up one day and said, my goodness. God made me head of this whole shooting match. Wow, that's interesting. Hmm. I was just a little shepherd. I was the eighth one out there doing my thing with the sheep. And God chose him. I, can, I have to live with that. Because what God says, let it be. So you are supposed to be seeking for glory and honor. Because you will be of far greater benefit to people from that position, presumably. So it's not wrong. One has only to look at the television to see if everybody's seeking glory and honor. Everybody wants to be a star. Now we better be clothed with humility. I see that. But we better not disparage God's plan. Honor and praise and glory. And it's also in 1 Peter 1 verse 7. Famous verse, badly translated, NLT got it right. There's going to be glory and praise and honor for you guys when Christ is revealed at the Apocalypse. It's the revelation. So it's a big thing. We haven't dealt with it. Someone yeah. mentioned earlier yeah. the, the Israel of God yes. topic. And this is... Uh, Absolutely. The Israel, the text applied to the Israel of the flesh. Yes. Now we're doing it to us. Mm -hmm. So this right. is an important topic. Very important topic. We are the Israel of God. We're God's chosen people. If we're true Christians, that's not to say there isn't a future for now, presently, national blinded Israel. There is a future for them. They have not been forgotten. Right. Through great tribulation, they're going to come to their senses. But for the moment, you are the Israel of God. Galatians 6.16, as distinct from the Israel of the flesh, 1 Corinthians 10.18, I think. The Israel of the flesh is quite clear. That's now blinded, unbelieving, stubborn Israel. It's just to clear it up for people, Basically. especially uh, viewing us who might not know us, visitors or something. Sure. Yes, we're, we're citing yep. Israel of the flesh texts. Yes. Isaiah 65, 66, Zephaniah, all the prophets, but we're applying it to, to the church now. So, so we, we are the Israel of, of the Spirit, there's no question about that. That's Philippians 3, 3, you are the Jews. Paul said, we are the true circumcision, the true Jews is us. Don't give your identity away to someone else in some uh, pseudo-humility. Yes, you are. You've got to be what God says you are. So we live with that title. Then in the future, of course, the now blinded, stubborn Israel of the flesh will become the Israel of the Spirit by conversion. The, the thesis, of course, for us all is that only in Christ is, are you going anywhere. So there comes a time when these people who are now blinded, who are not seeing right, they're not serving God, they have rejected their Messiah, the time has come when at least a remnant of them will become the true Israel of the Spirit. Of course, that, that's clear. It's rather like dropping a stone in the water and you get a circle, a bigger circle, a bigger circle. Ever expanding circles. Back. So See, there's, there's a sheep stealing. Yeah. And some people might accuse us of stealing Jewish texts. <laughs> so <laughs> we're we're stealing like, Jewish but texts. But we've got to remember that Christianity was Jewish. founded by Jews. By so Jewish. it's not us Gentiles stealing Jewish texts. No, no, no. We're no, following no, no. the New Absolutely. Testament Jewish writers. Yeah, we're, we're delighted to be. So thought worthy to be part of the Jewish thing. You want to... Okay, what else? 
we have some questions about baptism. I said we'd bring it up. As okay, we, we did. We have yeah, a, sure. a, a guy that's been mm -hmm. on here a couple weeks and okay. he's got a baptism question. Okay, it looks so, neat. I just thought we'll bring it up at the end. I'll be able to just finish, finish our chapter and. Uh, all questions are valid, of course. Anyway, you've got the Isaiah 65, 17, and you're marking what is 66, 22. There are two verses there about the... We could spend hours reading about the new creation. Don't forget that in Matthew 19, 28, Jesus spoke of the new age, exactly the same thing, the new creation. It's very much a political thing. You have 12 tribes, you have 12 apostles administering the world. It's much more vivid, I think, to these writers than it is to us. We're still laboring under the vague, waffly notion that we somehow go to heaven when we die and do who knows what. Again, I remind you of the dear Church of England clergyman who said, I have no idea what the second coming means. I don't preach on it. Now, I'm supposed to preach on it once, but I, I have no idea. Well, bless his heart, he didn't. Let's go after him. Let's explain it to him. So Isaiah 65, 22 and Isaiah 65, 17 are to be meditated on. Uh, verse and Acts 3.21, Randy Kasha's good text, Acts 3.21, 3.21, three, two, three, two, boom, we got that, Randy Kasha is now famous forever, <laughs> as the 3.21, go, we'll Randy. do a banner, Randy, yeah, Randy. Acts 3.21, Randy, three, two, one. so bring them on, Randy, more of that next week and subsequent weeks, please, so what have we got then, verse 14, have we read 14, no, nope. uh, therefore, dear friends, in view of the fact that you are expecting these things, be diligent to be found in peace mm -hmm. without defect and blameless wow. in his sight. Mm -hmm. 15, please. Buddy. And regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, mm -hmm. wrote to you. Yeah. As also in all his letters, speaking in them these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, as they do also the rest of the scriptures, for their own destruction. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard, so that you are not carried away with the error of unprincipled men, and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. You have to say this, Peter, is a very concise and to the point teacher, is he not? Doesn't he cover everything in a few well chosen sentences? I'll just comment on that last sentence. To him be the glory, the Lord and Saviour Jesus the Messiah, to him be the glory, both now and to the day which is an age in the Greek, not just the day of eternity. The day which is an age. Presumably he's thinking of the six thousand years, one of you know, an age is like a day. I don't know exactly what he meant by all that, but the day which is an age, the age-long day, a very old reference to the millennium, I would think, in the literal Greek there, the, the day which is an age. Otherwise, I mean, you could, you could certainly wax eloquent on some of these verses. Paul is not the place to start, so where do people start? With Paul. Generally, they start with Paul, and particularly the difficult verses of Paul. Don't want to start there. Paul is a bit above you. You're not necessarily up to it. You may not be expert enough to deal with Paul. So start with the simpler words of Jesus, perhaps in the Gospels, and graduate to Paul. But if you're untaught in any way, and unstable, you might risk distorting. That's the word which has to do twisting and distorting, turning, distorting, as they do also the rest of Scripture. My goodness. So Paul is Scripture, please note. Paul is Scripture here. Uh, Peter says, that's amazing, to their own apolia, to their own ruin and destruction. So you start twisting the verses and saying what they don't say, you're destroying yourself. That's, I would think, ill-advised. So, beloved then, knowing this beforehand, be on guard now. Don't get carried away by the error of unprincipled men. Fall from your own steadfast. I do want to mention one error, which is a serious one, affecting... 23 million Seventh day Adventists. You'll find that Ellen G. White did something very strange in Isaiah. Where it says in Isaiah 24 that God is going to He's going to punish the world, He's going to devastate the earth, He's going to shake it, and so on. And it says at the end of that passage in Isaiah 24 that few people will be left. Few. Few. So how few is few? I don't know. There's going to be a depopulation of the world. It's not a picnic, clearly. Few people will be left. However, Ellen G. White didn't say that, I read from her book, The Great Controversy. Her object here is to convince you that in the millennium there will be no human beings on the earth, only Satan. 
The saints will be in it. You're shaking your head. But 23 million Seventh-day Adventists are not. They're not in the head. The extent to which we've gotten ourselves in some difficulty. So her theory is that all the immortalized saints will be up there in heaven going over the books somehow to see who's fit for whatever. And there'll be nobody on there except Satan alone. I read the great controversy celebrated by 23 million Seventh-day Adventists not more or less intelligent than you. At the coming of Christ, the wicked are blotted from the face of the whole earth, she says. Consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed by the brightness of his glory. Christ takes his people to the city of God, she means, in heaven. And the earth is emptied of all its inhabitants. Ellen G. White, the guru found a prophetess, more than a prophetess, she calls herself, more than a prophetess. Behold, then she quotes, to make her point, she quotes from Isaiah 24, Quote, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty, makes it waste, turns it upside down, scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land will be utterly emptied, utterly spoiled, for Yahweh has spoken his word. Now go on. She's still quoting from Isaiah. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore, I'm quoting from Ellen G. White and the Bible, therefore the curse has devoured the earth, and they who dwell in it are desolate, Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, period, quote. Um, there's more to and she left out the little words, and few men are left. On that, she based her whole theory that the millennium has the devil alone on the earth. If that isn't crookery, what is? This is forgery, this is crookery, it needs to be exposed. Watch out. Check your gurus carefully. Are they telling you the truth, or are they just playing games with us? That's, that's, I saw that some years ago, I'm from this. <laughs> This is it says few people are left, not nobody's left. So the devil wins in her theology. He's in charge of the world, alone. For, yeah, what the, about the lion lying down with the lamb? Oh, and the, don't ask awkward the questions. We just read. Like, don't ask awkward questions. Because if they're in heaven, and Satan's and Satan's the earth with the lion and the lamb. What word are those? Yeah. I mean, half of Isaiah. It makes no Isaiah. sense at all that 23 million people are nodding their head to that. What are you doing about it? Are we going to help them? That would be the challenge. Can I comment on 17? I've, yes, please do. I've never quite read it this way, but it seems very clear. Mm -hmm. The conclusion of the entire book is that knowing all these things beforehand, yes. you have to be on guard. You've got to pay attention. Yes. You have an active right. responsibility yes, right. to do two things so that you're not carried away by mm -hmm. error mm -hmm. and, as a result, fall from yeah. your own steadfastness. Yeah. So error can carry you away, and you can actually fall from a firm foundation. Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's a warning there. It's, no, it's just, and the warning is, right. you've got to pay attention. You've got to be on guard. You've got to watch out. You're actually right. Yeah. And you're making the point about not one saved, always saved. Also, you're not. Yeah. That's a subject on its own. But this is a little bit tougher than what some of us get in church sometimes. So, yes, great Speaking point. Speaking of tougher, my, my version is a little mm -hmm. bit tougher than yours. Yours in 17 reads on the principle of men, I think. Yes. Mm -hmm. And mine... Reads, reads wicked people. Yes. Mm. Yeah. That's nice to have a variety of translations. Well, I was talking about the ones in verse 16 that are twisting and. Yes. You know, so those are, to me, those are like false teachers. Yeah. These, the, yeah. the preachers you see on TV or whatever, you know, the, the ones who take a little bit of scripture yeah. to, so it sounds good to people and then they make it into something that it's not. And because it says they're untaught, you know. Yes. I mean, they don't really like Ellen G. White, which you just read. She, mm -hmm. she, re, re, she did read part of that. I mean, part of that's in there. The destruction part. She just left out the, the renewal part. She did. Which is a whole lot. It of wouldn't work. be so bad if 23 million people hadn't followed her. I mean, she can make them, we all make mistakes. Yeah, that's why we have to be we have not to, untaught ourselves. That's right. You, you have, have to watch to your gurus. Don't get so obsessed with the guru. You think that everything he says is right. It may not be. Don't be carried away by right. error. We have to judge what's being taught and read right. and figure right. out. Yep. Apparently. Anyway, it doesn't make a good point there. It also then implies that you can fall uh, as a Christian. So we have to be on guard. It's a tall order, isn't it? Every time I read these books, I think these men are really setting the bar extremely high for all of us. All right, so what are we going to do something with so comments? So what's happening is, uh, I don't know if there's so much to... Um, yeah, there's a, a gentleman named Neil who yeah. lives in North Carolina, and he wants us to email him, he wants to hear from somebody, and I, I wrote down his email 
last week that I was traveling, so I forgot to give it to any of sure. you or forgot to contact it myself. But he has questions, but he has some questions about baptism. Um, if he wants to know if you were baptized previously as a Trinitarian or into a Trinitarian oh, oh, church, should yeah. you be rebaptized? Oh, yeah, that's a fair question. I, I, I would recommend. I baptized as a Trinitarian. <coughs> Yeah, I was uh, always recommending Dan Gill, I think, has sage words to say on that subject. It's he's new, he's new, so he doesn't know who he is either. No. So. It, it seemed to us, as we emerged from the Armstrong movement, where we did not believe in the true God, we did not understand that, and also many other things in the movement were, were hardly Christian, it, we chose to be rebaptized. I don't think any of us is guru enough to say, you've got to do it or else we're not into that, but it would seem like a reasonable approach to say, I, I wasn't with God when I got baptized. I didn't understand God. It seems reasonable to me, I'll, as strong as I can put it. But you start over and you say, now let me get baptized. I've now got God right. I think I understand Jesus. I've got the gospel of the kingdom. All right, let's get started. Now you can always say that in your previous experience that God was with you in some way. I wouldn't doubt that. Although for us personally, the Armstrong experience was hideous. The Church of England experience was nothing. It was vague. But uh, I'm not going to say that God hasn't been with us in some curious way from our start. That, that's fine. God can work through all of this, and he can work together for good in all the evil things we've done. I see that. But it certainly made sense to Dan Gill and his wife, and many others in our experience. They have chosen to be rebaptized upon coming to the understanding that God is one. I think it's a decision you have to make. You pray about it and say, oh God, examine He's my heart. He's in North Carolina, so yeah. if he wanted to come here oh, no and be problem. rebaptized, and Perfectly visit, reasonable. we could do that. Absolutely. Catch up with Jim Rich. Catch up with Jim Rich there in, in uh, Lenore is possible. We have lots of ways we can do it. If anybody would like to go to Scotland, uh, there's a dear lady there who's longing to be rebaptized after 33 years in the Watchtower. We don't have anybody on hand, but there is a gentleman in London who was with us recently. And I wrote to him this week and said, how about a little trip north? Yeah. That's possible. So we can work something out. Uh, now, earlier, uh, Big Buck Bob mentioned yeah. about um, somewhere where Paul says that he came not to baptize. First Paul, Paul, what, what is that scripture? No, he's in First Corinthians of course. 1. Yes, yeah, First Corinthians 1. He, didn't, he said, I didn't come to baptize, but I came to preach the gospel. But then he talks about all the people he did baptize. Yeah. <laughs> the whole point that he's trying to say is, I didn't come to baptize people into my particular sect. I'm a Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Christ, I'm of Peter. He's not, he said, I'm not trying to get you to join my group. Yeah. Like that's, That wasn't his, wasn't that Paul was against baptism. Not at all. Wanted that, to be. that needs to be clarified. Yeah. Paul didn't come to do the back of dunking. His agents did it exactly as is said in John, where it says that Jesus baptized more disciples than John. Is that clear? Jesus baptized more disciples than John. Actually, he didn't do the baptizing. His agents did. That's what it says. It's very easy to go from that then to Paul. I didn't come as the person who goes into the water. I forget actually which families I baptized, as Dustin says. He certainly baptized families. But to make that one text in any way undermine the lucid clarity of the rest of Scripture, I think is unwise. It's in the Great Commission. Go into the whole world and baptize and teach them everything I taught you. There's nothing to argue with here. There should not be. Unfortunately, people were brought up in some systems where only the late letters of Paul were valid. So then you got rid of Jesus, that's a bad idea. I don't think there's anything to baptize. In fact, there's nothing to argue about. In Acts 10, we have a very clear statement that Peter says, who can prevent the water? Bring on the water so that I can baptize these people. Bring on the water, and in the name of Jesus, he baptized them. If that's not clear, nothing is clear. The Henry Alford statement, scripture is wiped out as a testimony to anything if we start doubting what is really obvious to every commentator for 2,000 years in every language. Not necessary. Great question. Thank you. Okay, so Neil says he'd love to come here and be rebaptized. Wonderful. Let him think about it, pray about like whatever. We can always do that, yes. And we are. Somebody so, else who, I'm, I'm not sure who this person mm -hmm. is, a new person, I think. Yes. Because I have a question. I was baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit by Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes. Should I be rebaptized? Well, it's nothing to do with the formula that was muzzled over you. Uh, our understanding is that uh, that text in Matthew is perfectly valid. All Greek manuscripts have it. Jesus commands there that you get baptized into the combined authority of the Father and the Son and their Spirit. 
That's not a problem. If you do that, you're baptizing in the name of Jesus. That's not how. If you do it the way Jesus said to do it, you're baptizing as his representative. So both those formulas are, are, are valid. They're fine. The point is, what were you believing when you got baptized? That's the issue. Yeah. If you thought that Jesus was Michael the Archangel, uh, and you thought the kingdom of God came invisibly in 1914, there were 144 special ones. And if you were shaking your fist at the Lord's Supper, please note, by being told that you can't keep it, when Jesus said, do this, you were in frank disobedience, as we all were, then I think it's very wise to start out and say, my God, I was deceived. Now, let me get this right. So yes, free baptism would be something that one could rejoice in, I would think. Okay, great. Um, now, Thank Neil, wants you to read Acts 19, 1 through 5. Yeah, okay. Acts 19, 1 through 5. Wasn't on the Baptist baptism. Oh, that's the yes. These were people who had been baptized, of course, only into the baptism of John, which wasn't Christian baptism. It wasn't Christian baptism. I doubt whether baptism into the Watchtower is Christian baptism. So it's good to start over. This one is a special twelve people who had been baptized into the baptism of John. They weren't aware of the Spirit. I'm sure they knew that the Spirit of God existed. It's not they had never heard of the Spirit. They weren't aware that baptism into Christ brings the Spirit of God into your life. So, of course, then Paul laid hands on them and they received the Spirit, baptized them. But there's a proof of baptism, by the way. First of all, Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in Jesus. These people haven't done that. Who was coming after him? That is in Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized, of course. And then they received the Spirit. Paul laid his hands on them as apostles. If I, if I can read some uh, yeah. notes on the name thing in the name of, what, yeah. what does some yeah. mm -hmm. uh, commentaries here, the name stands for the person, yeah. recalling their appeal, their proclamation, right. their teaching, their confession, right. the threefold so, uh, so-called formula in Matthew, Yep. clearly aims to summarize the peculiarity of early Christian proclamation of sure. the gospel okay. as against other baptismal yeah. uh, rites or rituals and cannot be taken in the sense of later Trinitarian yeah. doctrine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, to say that this is a Trinitarian verse is rather like saying what sort of software did Paul have on his computer. It makes no sense, because every scholar who's read the works knows that the Trinity is a development so the, through Nicaea, the, through Chalcedon. The point is, in the name of, is, is they understood it. Yeah. Everything you yes. are and everything you stand right. for, even as I read recently, the presence of God is, is in his name. The presence of God is in his word, it's in his spirit, and right. his name. What well, Jesus, well, Jesus you're says... Baptized, if you think that the Holy Spirit is a person... A third person. Yes. It's certainly not quite accurate. I would say the, the Holy Spirit is certainly very personal. It's not impersonal, but it's not a third person who never gets worshipped and never gets prayed to, never sends any greetings. As 23 million Seventh day Adventists said, he's the shy member of the trio. They said that. At the same time as they said that the word one is inherently a plural word. They wrote that. What one you, actually is a mathematical one. We all know that. Your child of three knows that. <laughs> I was going to say that when Jesus talks about I have revealed the name, yeah. I have given my disciples yes. the name, no, I no don't one. think it's possible, but I don't think he was talking about he wrote it down somewhere. Probably not. He gave him a, a note. <laughs> hey guys, here, before I go, right. here's the name. I don't don't forget. Forget. And the parallel is clear. They've received your word. I've given them your name, and they've accepted your word. I get it. The name is the everything God stands for, everything he is. That's not so hard. Any Bible dictionary will explain that, by the way. Well, I think Neil's point by what he said here is that in Acts 19, <coughs> yes. this says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes. So, so he wants to know how you uh, reconcile that with, in Matthew, saying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So... Yeah. Which of those should it be? Let me try again. They're not in any way contradictory. Jesus says, when you baptize, you're to baptize people into the combined authority, presence, name of the three. And then if you're doing that, if you're doing that, 
You're doing it exactly as Jesus told you to do it, in which case you're doing it in his name. Well, I don't think they're formulas. They're not formulas. That's, that's well, the, 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 you have to slip and use the word formula, and I think that's a really They're not formulas. The mistake is to say these are verbal formulas. You've got to mutter those right. exactly. Right. Right. Yeah, you're being baptized into the Christian faith. Yes. That's it. That's all that it is. Sure. It? It's not like abracadabra. No. no. Yeah. Don't need to turn well, it into Well, or like if you say, because yeah. I've seen several baptisms, and sometimes they are into the name of Jesus. Mm. Right. That's I was baptizing the name of Jesus. I mean, yeah. I, at and the other time, time I Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or the name of the Father probably. and His Son. Right. I've seen it that way too. That's how no need to create a contradiction. They're not contradictory at all and turn, until you turn them into verbal formulas, then they can become. Yeah. Yes. I think and I don't think right. you're suggesting that every time you change one little doctrine, that you need to get rebaptized. No, no, no. We're, we're not subscribing that. Not because at all. That's my issue. Just, um, not at all. Yeah, no, I think it's a question of how you're defining God. If you go into the water not knowing who God is, if you think God is two gods in the God family, you're gospel. probably wrong. The gospel for <laughs> some is very unclear. But it would be nice to know that God is a single one-person God before you go in the water, I would think. That might be something Jesus and, might And, and if anyone who, who continues to have issues with this, yeah. you, you have to think seriously because what you're implying then if you're sticking to either the so-called Trinitarian formula dogmatically or the in the name of Jesus formula dogmatically, mm -hmm. I want people to really think about that because then you have a clear contradiction. In other words, the apostles in the book of Acts are clearly disobeying a clear command in Matthew 20 and 19. So I want you to think about that very clearly, yeah. study it, take your time, we know it's hard, but just think about the contradiction which is the tactic of a lot of people and a lot of scholars yeah. to make yeah. the New Testament writers contradict yeah. each well, other. We, I think we all yeah. know that that's impossible. So if you're, if you're writing at a contradiction, you know you're wrong. So you say, well, I have no idea what this is, but I know it couldn't be that. Because if it's that, then it's a contradiction. Well, the implication yes. is... Yes, implication well, is contradiction. It's contradiction. Yeah. Don't want to do that. Then you can look it up in the Expositors, uh, the Gabeline, edited by Gabeline, the Expositors commentary. They do this very nicely, this whole point that we're making here. Not hard, it's not difficult. Most these things are not difficult, but as Dustin said, okay. once you turn it into a strict right. verbal formula, right. then of course you're creating a contradiction. Well, it's a, it's difficult and when people are, are dogmatized, are oh, brought yes. up in systems, and, you know, and it takes time. We all know, we've all been dogmatized, yeah. we're trying to work our way out of that. Very good, so those are good comments. Did we have a number of people the rest of with us? When I was baptized, I believed that Yahweh the Father is the only true God, and the Son, Jesus, is the Son, yeah. and the Holy Spirit, God's power. Yeah. Just like Matthew 28, 19, sure. the way Jesus said. Sounds good. Sounds good, sounds good to me. Yep, um, good. Lorna, Jesus and God taught the same thing. Mm -hmm. They both work by the Holy Spirit. Yep. Um, Neil again says, says, I don't know if I was even aware of the Trinity when I was baptized. Okay. So does it matter what denomination you belong to as long as you, as long as you understand the truth? And uh, I, I, I leave him to make up his own mind. <laughs> I don't think we can legislate on this. He wants to talk to you, so we'll yeah. get you in touch with him. Certainly, yes. We'll talk with him I can only advise, while we're on this, you know that there are three places in Acts where you have them hands laid on them by apostles in Acts 8. Those people had accepted the gospel, but they hadn't received the Spirit. So they sent the apostles from Jerusalem to lay hands on these people. Why? Because these were the first converts in Samaria. Very special. You don't have to repeat that every time you have a convert. The apostles, it's impossible to reproduce that today. You can't do that. There are no apostles to send out from London or somewhere to lay hands on them. So that doesn't work. In that case, it was a brand new thing. The first Samaritans to get the gospel, they had received the understanding of the kingdom of God, and then the apostles arrived from Jerusalem to lay hands on that. Very special and not repeatable. To use the technical term, it's not normative for today. You couldn't do that. Then the other one is uh, in the case of Cornelius, isn't it, where hands are laid on him by the apostle. He's the first Gentile, apart from the Samaritans who are also Gentiles, but very singular individual. So the same thing happens there. And then this one in Acts 19, of course, where you have Paul encountering people that you couldn't encounter today. Do you know anybody who's only been baptized into, into John? I, I doubt that is possible today. In case then we need a special laying on of hands, the apostle can't produce that today. 
Not possible. So we use our common sense. Can I, can I just yeah. add this from another good article? Uh, yeah. The, the, this so-called formula, as Dustin rightly says, about Matthew, is, uh, this writer says, we, we recognize that that sort of language is even alive today. You yeah. could say, I did it in the name of love, humanity, and justice. Yes. There's also a famous statement in U.S. history right. that perfectly illustrates this use of the singular name when it is being used to mean in recognition of power yes. or authority. Good. And then he, he gives a quote about, in the name of the great Jehovah and the Continental Congress. How ludicrous it would be to conclude that what was really meant was that Jehovah and the Continental Congress yeah. were two different persons. Yes. Anyway, good comments. So I'll put it on here. The one in John I mentioned to you that I have given them your name and they've accepted your words. That's good common sense. Mm -hmm. Everything you stand for, I've given it to them. Not how to pronounce Yahweh. <laughs> that would be impossible. So all the fuss about pronouncing Yehovah or Yahweh is frankly completely beside the point and just creates arguments unnecessarily. Neil says, this is the best truth teaching on the internet. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, uh, Dan Schultz, sir. Sorry. I uh, said, this assembly is great. Right. Thank you all. You well, thank you for questions. listening. Yeah, uh, you know, we're all in different shoes. We were lucky enough to spend 30 years in the classroom, small classes, and so time at least to talk to a lot of people. That's not possible for everybody. I see that. So we're all, we're all in different shoes. That, that's simply the way we are. However, check internet. everything carefully because you can get carried away. You know, you, you have to keep your eyes open. If one, I think, shrinks from, I know my colleagues here would agree with this, if one tries to review and revise, if necessary, these truths every 10 minutes during the day, I do. Where are we getting this wrong? And I go through John 17, 3. You, Father, are the only one who's the true God. That seems to be quite conclusive. Brian Wright in front of me here is the only Brian Wright that I know on earth. Mm -hmm. Let's argue about that. Let's not. Etc. I mean, these are very easy things. The kingdom of God, if that's not the gospel, then forget it. It's quite wrong. Jesus is the Messiah. He's not God the Son. Paul does not have a Mac computer. Uh, the Queen does not have the American flag flying over Buckingham Palace. Nor do we sing God Save Our Gracious Queen in America. These are self-evident truths, but they're not self-evident once you join a church. That's more difficult. Then. Something like that. Okay. Did the person online say they were baptized in, in the tower? Uh, <laughs> in the tower. In the oh, yeah, tower is, you must explain yeah. tower. Yeah. You must explain yeah. tower. Yeah. I don't think Neil was, I think. Watch um, tower. Yeah. <laughs> Jake W, right? John. John. And they said they, Disciple John. And they, were, and they used the Matthew 28 19, I think he said. Because I thought the JWs were. No, that's the other, that's yeah, that the other guy that's asking. In the, in the name we have of two Jesus. people asking questions oh, about that. Yeah. So by telling My writing's real teeny tiny today. I don't know why, so I can The Watchtower. Right, because the Watchtower has this in, in the name of Jesus only, right? Probably. Baptist. I, I don't know. Neil yeah, says right. most church sermons are motivational, well, not this, teaching the truth. Well, of I hope this has been motivational as well. We're hoping that this is motivational. Right? <laughs> We're not I know. I know what they need. Yeah, we know. What they I think the, the good, feel-good stuff. You know, is sometimes the attitude is used always all heart knowledge instead of this awful head knowledge that we do. This boring intellectual head knowledge. They just have a relationship. But actually, the word used in the in the in Second Peter three of today was to stimu stimulate your thinking yeah. rather than motivation. <laughs> I mean, and I think, if I remember correctly, he used that word in chapter one too, because that is his aim, is to stimulate our thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And that is the aim of everybody who writes or blogs or talks to people. Right. We desperately want to get people to, to think. Well, right, right here, Second Peter 1 said it. We read it. I stimulate yes. his genuine minds by reminding you. Yes. So, like what we're trying to do is, yes. where would we be though without an audience that's sympathetic out there? So we rely entirely, well not entirely, but largely on people who, who find this sort of simple teaching compelling, as we do. Are there any churches in Florida, Abrahamic faith type like churches in Florida? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is the lady at the hotel that you know. Yeah. <laughs> you get the church at the hotel. Daytona to Miami is quite a distance. So.
This country is on the large right. side, you know, that's what makes our operation difficult. Does she talk Molly Nurse? No, I, I think she works. Uh, there's a lady in Texas uh, who is out there today, has been with us in the past, and is back with us. And there are others who phone during the week and say they're enjoying what we do on Sunday, so that's encouraging. Okay, we will sing a no? first. No, we don't have, no, have, we don't have it. that's fine, we don't need to do that. We will just, uh, I didn't appoint somebody to maybe call us for closing prayer in a moment. Would you do it for us? Mm -hmm. So, I will we read you the other just couple comments. Please, yes, yes. Um, no, we have time. Go ahead. Um, yeah, a person named A. Willis, which mm -hmm. I think this is their first time here, mm -hmm. says, I'm so happy I found this with Yahweh's help. I was so sad and lost since I left Jehovah's Witnesses. I didn't want to go to a church. I wanted to go where Yahweh's spirit was not the Trinity. It's wonderful. Wow. We are thrilled to pieces with that because we are very much concerned with former Jehovah's Witnesses who suffer a great deal when they are apostatized by the movement. And we really are close in some regards with our sleep of the dead, with our kingdom of God on earth, with our anti non or non trinitarianism So you belong, if I may suggest that, with us, and that's wonderful. So keep at it. And then um, this Lorna, who's I think yeah. we did, says, Agreed, motivates me because it is the truth. Mm -hmm. And there is a great future to look forward to. Yes. And wonderful. Uh, Willis says, This is a blessing from Yahweh. May he bless you all. Um, Neil then says, pastors give one to three scriptures and then 45 minutes of motivational speaking. <laughs> Fill the plate and see you next week. <laughs> Actually, we're missing the plate. <laughs> yes, we don't pass a plate. So. Well, we, we did at least read the whole of a chapter of Peter, so you were exposed to Peter's words that prevented our, our waffling from getting out of hand. Very good. Though, I, I'll repeat, though, that there are 8 million Jehovah's Witnesses at the doors of various people across the world. They really do belong in our circle. So go after them and do appreciate that it's very difficult to come out of the Witnesses without suffering a great deal. Yeah, good. I think this general, disciple John is, is yeah. doing with that. No, he's in Miami. Oh. Okay, so very good. We're going Miami. to... Uh, Ask us to close with and then we'll do the and then we're going to do an anointing as as one of our people here has requested that to. offset. Okay. okay. You then pray for us if you yep. care to stand. Appreciate that cause we'll close and pray for us. Uh, Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for uh, the Cox's travels and everything went well. We ask mm -hmm. you for prayer for the uh, Chi family in Brazil who are traveling back home to Canada tonight. We thank you for uh, uh, all the people at the conference and uh, we thank you for the uh, leaders of this church, Anthony especially, <coughs> and uh, Barbara. We ask you for uh, healing uh, for any mm -hmm. sicknesses or anything else and uh, you, you know Lord God uh, what we're all lacking or what we need. Mm -hmm. We thank you for this uh, preservation of, of your uh, gospel message and for your son and his great sacrifice and and we thank you for uh, these prophets these apostles peter and mm -hmm. paul and we thank you for their steadfast faith in in a very wicked age uh, the roman empire that uh, eventually killed a lot of them we thank you for uh, them holding on to the faith once received and passing it on to us Peter talks about uh, people who uh, scoff your uh, word and your prophecy, but we're here because we believe that word, and we believe, Lord God, that you will be faithful, and you will bring, bring it. You'll bring the kingdom, and our immortality is at hand. We thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, very good. Are we still online?